Uh, Jesus says, what are the best third-party backup softwares that you recommend? So when it's in an enterprise, usually enterprises have their own backup software that they've picked. They have things like uh, Data Domain or Commvault. They have these big appliances and things like that. Um, but uh, when you, oh, yeah, I didn't know, Pilot Coder, I didn't update the code on my end. All I did is work directly in the GitHub, and that was it. Um, but Jesus, if you're talking about SQL Server backup, like if you get to choose, pick and choose your own SQL Server specific products, the main ones out there are uh, Idera SQL Backup or Idera SQL Safe. Uh, Quest, Lightspeed, and Redgate SQL Backup. Those are the three main ones that are out there. Uh, yes, Matt, I don't, Matt, I'm to the point where I just won't even respond to those. I'm just like, yep, good luck, uh, good luck. Um, let's see here, what else? <laughs> Surly Dev says Commvault is awesome, not specifically for SQL Server backups, but for network file backups. Right, it's also terrible for SQL Server backups. At least in, in my experience, the performance has been horrific, uh, and the schedules aren't reliable, like it doesn't back up at the times where it's supposed to back up. If you only need daily backups and you don't care about losing a day's worth of data, it's not really that bad, but often in uh, like SQL Server production environments, I have to make sure that I get backups on certain time schedules and that we don't overlap with jobs and things like that. All right, so let's see. Let's go see what the next uh, pull request is all about. I've already forgotten. See what we got here. I love Amsterdam. It's just a beautiful, beautiful city. And I'm not into the like the weed or prostitution kind of things. Like I've never drunk, done any drugs in my life at all. Um, I am just a total dweeb on that. I've done alcohol, tobacco, you know, sort of cigars, stuff like that. But that's as far as I've never even smoked weed. And it's like, eh, it's not. Stuff makes you lazy. I don't need a drug to be lazy. I'm the laziest person that you will ever meet. And every now and then people are like, oh, Brent, you're so productive. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm, well, I get off this camera, at, well, I have to go write client findings today, but after that, as soon as that's finished, I'm going to be drinking tequila and sitting, at, sitting, on the, uh, uh, sitting on the balcony. No, I haven't tested, I haven't tried cocaine. It's just really expensive. Oh, let me switch over back to the, the Q&A. Um, Santa says, I hate to sound ungrateful, but the idea event requires registration individually. Oh, my God. Oh, are you serious? Oh, my... You have to check boxes and, t and type things in to get training? Oh, my God. Oh, that's terrible. I, I feel for you. There, there may be support groups in your area to help you cope with problems like that. Then again, maybe not. Uh, Farshid says, uh, what would be the benefit? I know, right? I'm, I'm absolutely terrible. Oh, you've got all kinds of questions popped up here. Oh, okay, we'll switch over and do questions for a little while. So let's see here. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Farshid says, what would be the benefit of third-party backup tools where we have maintenance plans working like a charm? Encryption and compression options. So like often in enterprises, you need different kinds of encryption or, or stronger compression. SQL Server compression is okay. It's not great, but it's not really that tunable. Um, better log shipping GUI is another great example. Backing up to cloud providers like Amazon S3 storage. Uh, SQL Server's backup to Azure Blob Storage is kind of hit or miss. Vendors tend to do much better jobs of that. So there's just a quick sampling of different reasons for it. Uh, let's see here. What else was there? Dtovi says, it seems like you can get high availability with the current SQL servers. Do you recommend using it as I would like to pull the databases into one server? I'm not sure what you mean by it. Maybe rephrase the question. I'm not sure about what product you're talking about there. Jan says, do you know any good script to get information with privileges for tables and database needs based on their activity? No. Um, what you would have to do is you would have to capture all of the queries that are running and who's running them. So there are third-party appliances that do that, like IBM, Guardium, and Imperva, but they're like six figures. They're like $100,000 and up. Uh, so usually when I show that to people, they're like, ah, I was just curious. I'm like, yeah, okay. So um, let's see here. Neil says, what makes more money, production database administrator or dev DBA? Oh, that's a really interesting question. What makes more money? I don't know that it's as much about that as it is about the company that you work from. 
do work for. Um, Jan, auditing tool for SQL Server is good for this. Not really, because the problem is it's really easy to bypass that kind of thing. And also, if the tool goes down, it overwhelms SQL Server shuts down. So I, I would not recommend that for that goal. Um, but Neil, if, if you had to choose one, the thing that I would choose is, what do you enjoy more? Do you enjoy production automation, uh, PowerShell, uh, managing servers in the cloud? If you enjoy that, then you'll spend, you'll, the, the time will be easier, your work will flow more easily, and it'll be easier for you to get good at it. If you prefer tuning queries, reading execution plans, uh, talking to users about their query design, talking developers about their query design, then Dev DBA will end up being a, a more easier to excel at type of career, but they are very different. Um, you can make 150, 200,000 a year at either of those if you're good at them. The catch is that you just have to be good at them. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Greg says, what are, what are your virtual session environment resources for SQL 2019? I'm not sure what that question means. Maybe rephrase it. I'm not sure what you mean by virtual session environment resources is. Um, Fiker says, my friend is wondering if query store will help when all the stored procedures coming to SQL Server are encrypted. Why not test? Right? You could whip up a test to do that in like 30 seconds. And I know because you've asked me this question on several webcasts, and I'm going to be kind of tough on you here. Roll up your sleeves and find out. It's really not that hard, right? You could do this. So go do it. Um, Surly Dev, do you want me to queue questions in featured chat and bring them on screen? Yeah, sure. I wasn't originally going to do this, but, you know, there's so many Fast and Furious coming. I was like, oh, yeah, sure, I guess. Might as well. Uh, let's see here. So what I'll do, so Surly Dev, I'll hit the YouTube ones live as they come in, just as I catch them, so that that way you don't have to copy paste back and forth, just instead of... <laughs> that's my feeling too. Uh, I'm going to start calling him Cobb. Uh, I'm, that's my feeling too. I hate production DBA work. I mean, I just hate it. Uh, I, production DBA work involves being on call. I don't ever want to be on call again if I can help it. I like being drunk on a beach. Being drunk on a beach is an easy thing to do if you're develop. Oh, okay, all right. Well, thanks, sir. That's cool. Then let's uh, we can go for it. Um, that it, it, it's, I want to be drunk on a beach with like no worries about if something explodes, it's not my problem. And generally speaking, it's easier as a development DBA to be drunk on a beach. Now, you're still going to have performance emergencies, but they're going to come way less often than if you're in a production DBA that has, uh, so that's called jack of all trades and you don't make very much money at it. You can do okay, but jack of all trades, you're competing with everybody. You're com competing with the uh, local sysadmin on some, you know, nine, $10 an hour shop. You're competing with people on Fiverr. Um, there, if you want to sharpen your knives and hit the 150, 200,000 a year, that's where you got to start specializing and being known as the person person to solve one particular problem. But jack of all trades just don't make that much money. Drunken DBA. So I've also thought about, um, there's this website, Drunk Usability Reviews. And at Drunk Usability Reviews, this usability expert gets drunk and he uses your website and videotapes the whole th thing so that you can see what it's like when someone drunk is using your website. And he just gives you unfiltered advice. I was thinking the other day, it would be really cool to have drunken database testing where someone could send me their database and send me their code and say, hey, I want you to look at this stored procedure and tell me what you think. And I thought, oh, that would be kind of fun. And then the reality hit me that I would be drunk all the time and being on camera. And that's probably not the best thing for my career, like long term wise. Plus, I, I drink enough as it is without getting involved in that. And that would make things even worse. It does sound like a country song. It sounds like the kind of, like five o'clock somewhere. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Jimmy Buffett. All right, so let's see what we got. What's uh, up first, uh, uh, Surly Dev? What question do you want me to go uh, tackle? Uh, Chris, I almost did that. I almost actually, I was like, it's empty. Uh, I should probably do something about that. Um, SQL Dev DBA says dev teams can be their own DBA as long as they're willing to be up with me at 3 a.m. troubleshooting code. My, my uh, usual rule with clients is if someone's going to be sysadmin on the server, if they're going to be allowed to log into the SQL server directly or have sysadmin rights, then they have to be in the on-call rotation, full stop. If you're in the on-call rotation, then you're allowed to uh, get sysadmin rights, but only then. 
I should make sure that featured chat is actually down all the way on the screen too, because I don't know where it's going to pop up at. Let me move it down here just to get it there. All right, cool. Um, oh, it worked there. Oh, okay. Let me move it. Uh, let me move it up higher, and then that way it's up here. Uh, so from YouTube, CT says, "Hi, Brant. When it comes to deadlocking, we're seeing deadlocks in the same session. I'm totally confused. Is it possible? Yes. What it's the keywords to look for are parallelism deadlocks." They're also called intra-query deadlocks, intra, I-N-T-R-A, intra-query deadlocks. What it means is that uh, typically, the way it's usually happening is, say you have a four-threaded query, a query that went max stop. Ha, 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 ha. Hold on a second. Let me move that around here, too, because I think I moved the wrong chat. Let me move this chat down here. There that goes, and then let's see, featured chat is up there, Streamlabs alert, let's move that down here. There we go, I think I got everything where it's supposed to be. All right, cool. Um, so uh, so say you have a four-threaded query, and two, it goes, the queries go parallel, you have, it breaks out across four threads, and uh, two uh, threads are trying to access the same resources, that's where you can run into it. So even just one session can deadlock itself. When you search for parallelism deadlocks, and no, I'm not going that long, this one will be super quick. So, uh, so yeah, that's the end of it. Search for intra-query parallelism deadlocks. In, uh, both Itzik Ben Gan and Paul White, I think both have pretty good uh, exhaustive tutorials on this one. Let's see, Pierre Letter, speaking of database administration, and Pierre, I saw your pull request in too. May not get to it today. We'll see how it goes. Do you think dev DBA dev team should be their own DBA as much as possible? I'm kind of fighting the infrastructure team on this topic. My feeling is if you're willing to be in the on-call rotation, and if you can answer some basic questions about whatever high availability and disaster recovery technology we use, then you're allowed to be in the sysadmin rotation. You're, and it is, if you're a sysadmin, you're in the on-call rotation, full stop. And you don't get to pick and choose which servers it is. You're on call with the rest of us on all of the servers. Because if you can solve a clustering problem on your server, you can solve a clustering problem on any server. And you're welcome to join me. I need all the help that I can get in the on-call rotation. Um, and it, uh, 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 so uh, Surly Dev says, devs get the power and the responsibility. I feel my dev is much more efficient than DBAs because, yeah, it, it absolutely can depend on the team. I also know some teams where I say, all right, in production, we're using always on availability groups for high availability. If the cluster stops, tell me what steps you use in order to troubleshoot the root cause of the problem. And you'd be surprised. Some of them have answers. Some of them don't. But then that's how you decide. So you go, okay, so if you're going to be sysadmin on the server, that means that you can break the cluster. So if you're going to be able to break it, I also need you to know how to fix it. So it's your choice. If you want to get sysadmin rights, we're going to send you to a clustering class first. We're going to get you up to speed. Then I'm going to do some quick testing with you to make sure that you can restart your uh, cluster when it fails or fail over from one server to another. Um, I'm not going to teach you. I wish I could, but I, I just don't have enough bandwidth to bring everyone up to speed. But that's what classes are for, and I'd love to send you to a class. Would you like to go to a class on that? You're going to finish that before you get the sysadmin rights. Oh, you don't want the class. Okay, then you're not sysadmin. And it's just that simple. And then once you do go through the class, if you're willing to troubleshoot the cluster, then by all means, let's hop in the on-call rotation, and you can be in with the rest of us. Uh, does with encryption and stored procedures use the plan cache? Well, let's do a demo. And for that, since y'all are so keen on the hourglasses, so this is a half hour hourglass. Technically, it's like 25 minutes. And I use it all the time in my uh, query tuning classes to show how much or how little progress you can make in 25 minutes. So we're going to flip it, and we're going to go do a demo. Let's go find out. <laughs> So let's say, let's go create a stored procedure. So first we will create or alter. Whoops, my keyboard got disconnected. It's been too long since I start, since I typed. That's not a good sign. Um, so create or alter proc, DBO, USP, get latest user, latest user, as select top 10 star from DBO users, uh, users, order by last access date desk. Go. Now am I in the Stack Overflow database? Yeah, okay. Execute. 
then DBCC free proc cache go exec USP get latest user go 10 and then after that we'll go run SP blitz cache and we'll go see what we have inside of there so let's free the plan cache and run the query 10 times then I'm going to DBCC why did you Oh, because I can't have a semicolon. That's the dumbest freaking rule. Can't have a semicolon after the go. So stupid. All right, there we go. It's ran 10 times. Now let's go run SP Blitz Cache. So what SP Blitz Cache gives you is it gives you the most, uh, gives you your most resource intensive queries in the plan cache. Now what I have here is I have that stored procedure, oops, collapse that back out. I have that stored procedure ran 10 times. So the plan cache is getting used when this thing is not encrypted. Now let's go see how to uh, encrypt a stored procedure. I can't remember if it's just with encryption or not. How to encrypt SQL Server stored procedure. So let's see, MS equal tips, do, 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 and then come down here. There it is, with encryption. <laughs> you know it's not going to be good when that's all you have to do. Uh, so now we'll say with encryption, 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 go create or alter the stored procedure. Now we'll do the same thing, free the plan cache and run it 10 times. Then we'll run SP Blitz cache and see what we get. And now let's move it over here and see what we have here. So here it says, we couldn't find a plan for this query, more info on possible reasons. And there's a link that will go take you to where you can learn more about why we can't see the plan. Number 10 or 10 executions there, that tells you that yes, it is using the plan cache, but the plan isn't saved in a way that you can view it because when things are encrypted for security reasons, whatever, there you go. Now, I, that sounds like you want to immediately encrypt all your stored procedures to stop people from seeing how truly terrible your code is, because we both know how bad you write code. The thing is, though, it's super easy to decrypt. If you search for uh, SQL Decryptor, uh, so SQL Decryptor from DBForge, this tool, it costs money, uh, but you can get the demo version totally for free, and the demo version works, and it decrypts queries within like, or decrypts stored procedures, functions, all kinds of stuff within like five seconds. It's absurdly fast. Uh, so I just wouldn't think, I wouldn't want you to think that that's like a real life defense mechanism because when I encounter vendors who are trying to uh, encrypt their stuff to stop me from seeing it, I just go grab this tool, I run it right in front of them and I'm like, okay, here is your code. What did you think you were stopping me from? So now let's stop playing games. Let's stop encrypting your stored procedures, leave them decrypted. And then that way we can all do a better job of performance management together without you having this little charade. Sometimes vendors encrypt their stored procedures just because they want to make sure that users aren't editing them. I get it. But when you have performance problems, stop playing around with that. Okay. <laughs> So we've been going for like 50 minutes, so I should probably get some uh, more coffee or something to drink here too as well. Um, we'll take one more question and I'll answer, actually no screw it, we'll go off and do a uh, bio break. Um, unless, unless, unless I gotta, I'm just watching to make sure somebody didn't post the, oh, I should have said too. Okay, see, uh, so that's why I don't usually flip the hourglass when I'm doing questions, because there really wasn't that much uh, stuff inside there. Okay, so let's uh, come back and we'll do a five minute bio break. And when we come back, we will uh, hit the next set of questions. We'll do questions for the rest of the hour because clearly all have a bunch of questions all uh, piled up. <laughs> Sorely done. Uh, so perfect time for a bio break. We will be back. Let's see here. I have a new fancy five minute timer on the stream too. <laughs>
Welcome back, party people. Uh, so let's see here. So now I guess we can go on uh, with questions and answers. It's a beautiful morning here in sunny San Diego. I should have turned the camera around on my, my side camera so that you can see uh, looking outside of the city too whenever I, uh, when we take breaks. Let's see, Surly Dev says, Jesus, what do you say, what do you feel when someone resume highlight headline says SQL Server and Oracle DBA? I can't even cope with one. They're so more surprisingly similar than you would think. The biggest problem is the operating system. Uh, if you are going to do operating system level work, it tends to be Linux for Oracle and it tends to be Windows for SQL Server. Um, so if you, if you only had one operating system, the job would be a lot easier as long as we were only talking about production database administration work. Production database administration is managing backups, patching, cluster failover, uh, cluster troubleshooting, error logs, etc. A lot of those kinds of tools these days are much more multi-platform than they used to be. Performance tuning, forget it. Performance tuning is absolutely, uh, totally different between the two platforms. And if somebody says that they performance tune both of them and they do production work, they don't do jack. They're just basically Googling every time they hit an error. So, yeah. Uh, but it's same. A lot of times, you'll see people who are like, "I'm a data scientist and a developer and a production sysadmin." No, you're a Googler. That's all you are. Maybe bang, whatever. Probably not, or else they would suck. All right, who's next? Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, let me move that down just a little bit here so that I can get the whole thing on the screen. There we go. Jan says, I sometimes have a problem with SP Blitz who, SP who is active when I have ongoing transactions that block almost all queries. Is there an option in SP Blitz who that can resolve this? I would want to know more about what the block is. So if you use that get locks feature that we saw over in uh, SP who is active, or if you look at the code in SP Blitz lock, or SP Blitz who, or blah, blah, SP who is active for pulling the locks, my guess is that something is catastrophically taking a lock across system DMVs, which shouldn't be happening, or you have an issue where your server is so starved for resources, like you're hitting thread pool or resource semaphore issues, where queries can't even start. So my guess is that it's something much ca more catastrophic or larger than that. Um, and I, it's beyond what I can answer quickly, that you're not missing a magic option. There's, you want to find the root cause of that blocking. If you're used to using SPHU and SPHU2, use it, but find that root cause because you're facing catastrophic level issues if either SPHU is active or SPBlitzHU don't run. All right. I saw Barrett wants a plug for the channel. I tend not to do that here. I, sorry, I just I don't do that just with the, the big wide audience that we have and trying to manage all kinds of questions and whatnot. You're welcome to do uh, uh, shout outs yourself, though. Uh, Surly Dev uh, says, or Fur Fur Farshid says, could you please explain the true meaning of MaxDop? Is it, does it says that the database engine is allowed to set parallelism degrees or does it say, okay, so I don't know when this if this behavior has always been true, but for at least the last few releases, since I've been doing performance tuning, since at least the last few re releases, queries will generally either go single-threaded or they'll go to max stop. Generally, there's nothing in between the two. There are edge cases. For example, if you're doing column store index builds, SQL Server will gradually ramp down the amount of parallelism. But if you think about just regular select queries, inserts, updates, and deletes, things are either going to go single threaded or else they're going to go to max stop, which is kind of confusing because uh, it makes it sound like it's the maximum degree of parallelism when it's really just in most cases the degree of parallelism. It's not really the maximum. If you go through books online, uh, uh, there's there are articles that kind of hint towards this, uh, but it's just not black and white. There, there are also ed gotchas around the number of cores that are used uh, for, uh, there's a coordinating thread, th uh, qu queries can go parallel up to max stop several times just using the same number of cores. I have a whole module about parallelism in my mastering query tuning classes. It's about an hour long that goes into this. So if you're a live class season pass provider, hit the parallelism module in mastering query tuning. And if you're not a live class season pass pro a partner or a holder, you could always go get one. Okay, let's see. So one went by really quickly there. Let me see what that was. So let's see here. The See if I can see it. 
I don't know which one went past. Uh, oh, it's, okay, he got it. There we go. Um, do you think table partitioning in Azure SQL makes sense with respect to performance? What table partitioning is for is when you're loading an entire partition at once or you're deleting an entire partition all at once. It's a maintenance feature, not a query performance feature. Because if you're talking about just quickly getting to the data that you want for a select query, if you just want to eliminate the range, that's what indexes are for. You just need plain old indexes. But if you want to load an entire partition all at once or drop an entire partition all at once, that's what partitioning is good for. And for that, it doesn't make a difference whether you're in Azure or whether you're in a uh, conventional on-premises SQL Server. They both work the same way. And they're both great for that. Partitioning is great for that feature. It's just useless for select performance. I say useless, but it's, it's pretty damn useless. All right, uh, what else we got in here next? Mm. Uh, let's see here. Neil says, is that electric calendar on the wall above the chair? Yes, I'll show you. Uh, so let's go over to, uh, oh, okay, all kinds of things here. Uh, so first we'll hit the electric uh, calendar above the chair. So this thing is uh, Simone Yetch's Everyday Calendar. Let's get this off and go uh, spelunking with it. So this is Simone's Everyday Calendar where it's got a little button for each day of the month. And then you press the button and the days light up. So, and it's going to be hard to see that some of these are lit up over there. Um, because it doesn't work as well in bright sunlight. I don't have the brightness turned all the way up, uh, but it gives you a rough idea there. You're supposed to hit the, de uh, the uh, day and it turns on and off. So let's see if I can get it just right here. So then you can turn the days on and off just by touching them. So it's supposed to help you build up good habits uh, by clicking on the days where you did the task, which is true if you actually do the tasks. I think for me, the, the idea of using it is that I wanted to find a really hard task that I may not actually do every day. And that's exactly what ended up happening. I did the thing for three days and I wasn't able to do it for the last several days. And so you're exactly right. Like today's the 6th of September and I have not, let me go pop over to this other camera. Um, today's the 6th of September and I haven't done that task and it just absolutely kills me. And I'll talk more about what the task is in a future stream at some point, but I don't want to talk about it just yet. All right, and you, Galambunga, you're right, it's like shame. That's what it's for, because every time I walk past there, I'm like, damn it, I got to hit that button today. And I'm, you know, it's, it's a constant strive of, can I do the thing and mark it off or not do it today? So, all right, uh, what else? Any other questions in the queue? Doesn't look like we have any other questions in the queue. So off we go. We could go back to uh, working on the, it might be better into his reverse flashing until you hit it. You can, there are buttons you can to, uh, hit to change the thing too. Oh, DTOVI. Okay, so I would like to set up an active passive cluster on our production servers for high availability. If only one server is active, it's included in the license. Uh, so since SQL Server 2019 came out, not if you're using 2019, but since it came out, there's been a dramatic change to licensing. So let's go see what it is. <laughs> So the dramatic change over to licensing, if I go look over at SQL Server licensing change 2019 high availability, and I'll go get this and go throw it into the Twitch channel at least, and then see if I can put that in here, paste, there we go. Um, so new of high availability and disaster recovery benefits for SQL Server. And this is direct from Microsoft. This isn't something that I wrote. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of scroll over in here so that you can see it. First bullet point, new failover servers for high availability. You can run a passive instance in a, separating, a separate op operating system absolutely for free. You get one for disaster recovery as free too. Before, it was for every one primary you bought, you got one secondary for free. Now, it's you get one for high availability and one for DR, and you can run one in uh, Azure as well. Now, this is, yep, as Pierre says, you need software assurance, which I would just say for every SQL server that matters, you need to have software assurance anyway. Um, 
but really slick. So you can go into the, that uh, blog post there for more details. Very useful. I absolutely love that feature. You can't query them, though. It's only for uh, high availability and disaster recovery. You can offload your backups. So this is kind of cool. They kind of buried it way down here. They say, in addition to HA and DR, the following operations are now allowed on the passive notes, check DB, full, log, full and log backups, and doing uh, monitoring software. So like running uh, things like IDERA SQL DM against the server to make sure that it's ready for failover. So that is absolutely wonderful. I am so glad that Microsoft did that. That is fantastic. Really slick change. This matters, uh, this works for whether you're running 2019 or earlier versions. As long as you're currently product protected under software assurance, that includes you, which is kind of magical. All right. Let's see what else we got inside here. Um, Aberrant says, uh, oh boy. A Baron says, I want to air gap production databases on the intake side. Would you recommend a message queuing third party or use service broker built in? Well, if you're using service broker, you're not air gapped, right? So if you're going to allow people to connect directly to service broker and post queue messages, you're not air gapped anymore. So what you could do is you could log things to a queue, but if you're going to log things to a queue in the year 2020, you shouldn't be using service broker because it costs money. Whereas there are third party queuing services. If you're up in Azure, they have a queue. Amazon has uh, simple queuing services. And those are banana pants cheap. They're like a dollar for a billion messages. You know, it's just absolutely insane. I want to say it's like everything that we do in SQL Constant Care is all queue driven. We uh, uh, Richie posts things into a queue whenever he needs to move data around or, or say that data is ready to be moved around. And I want to say we spent 10 bucks on simple queuing services last month and we post billions of messages inside there. So I just wouldn't use Service Broker for that in the year 2020. Then you have your app, whatever app you want to pull stuff off of the queue, or if you want SQL Server itself to go pull things off of that queue, you could. But air gapping, that kind of solves that one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's go. I'm going to add. Do, 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 do. Was there anything else in there that I wanted to hit? I think that's it. Scrolling back up. I think we're good. All right. So in that case, we'll go. Uh, I'll give you all another 30 seconds to get questions in. And if you don't have it in, we will go uh, do the next poll request. Mm. Poronga says. I'm mossy, mossy, moss. Uh, I have many store procedures that completely delete a table and reinsert 99% of the same data. Is there any technique that you advise for this? Yeah, I will switch to data warehousing. So like an ETL tool, extract, transform, and load. What you want to do is go pull wherever you're going to pull the source data from, then have that tool compare against the rows that already exist and only insert the changed rows. The design process you're looking for is called ETL, like extract, transform, and load. And uh, so it's a common kind of thing that people do with SSIS uh, or Azure Data Factory. And you don't want to write one big ginormous merge statement. You don't want to use things like change detection or change tracking. You want to use one of those tools that will help you detect what needs to be inserted and what doesn't. It's not a trivial task. It's the kind of thing that you would expect to spend days building. But so if it's, I'll tell clients, if you can do the truncate and reload in 10 seconds, sure, truncate and reload. But if it's going to take more than 10 seconds, more than once a day, you may want to think about re-architecting it so it only inputs change uh, stuff. Uh, Keith says over on YouTube, how do you make an index job run faster in a data warehouse? We are using Ola Hollingren and mostly the default settings from Ola. The first thing that I would just ask is, why are you doing the index maintenance? So if you Google for Brent Ozar, why defragmenting your indexes isn't helping, so Brent Ozar, why defragmenting your indexes isn't helping. I have a whole video on why it isn't usually helping for performance posts. <laughs> it's, it's totally true. Um, we, <laughs> it's a pretty much everything I've got a video for or whatever. Um, and I'm not saying you should never do it, but in data warehouses, that's especially one of those times where you go, I don't know that it really makes sense to rebuild indexes on a data warehouse. Uh, that's where other solutions tend to make more sense. 
Uh, I'm going to go check to see, too, that my air conditioning is turned on all the way down, that it didn't kick off, because I have a feeling, no, it sounds like it's running. Uh, it's probably going to be time that I'm going to have to pull my sweatshirt off. Finally, thank goodness. Yeah, okay, no good. It's still going full tilt. It's pretty quiet, so it's kind of hard to hear, but that is, uh, was getting kind of uh, warm inside here. But I'll leave the sweatshirt on for the rest of the stream there. Only got uh, a little while left. Um, Let's see. Uh, Mossy Moss says change detection is a bad idea. Specifically, change data capture or change tracking. Those two features built into SQL Server, I am not saying that they're a bad idea, but they're, when I'm going to turn either of those on, that's where I'm going to have a full-time ETL professional who manages those kinds of features. It isn't something that I would want a developer or a production database administrator turning on. Those features have a lot of gotchas, and I want to make sure that they are implemented correctly. So often I've seen people you know, hit it, set it, and forget it, thinking it's going to work forever and have no performance overhead, and those are not those kinds of features. Uh, okay, so let's see here. What else? A uh, couple things came in there. Um, M Boom, M Boom, what? M Boomars. Uh, M Boomars says Imagine that you have an 8 terabyte database. I have clients with 80 terabytes in our SQL servers. Uh, how would you best go about performing a check DB? For me, when you get over multiple terabytes, you basically have two choices. You can either use always on availability groups and run both your check DBs and your backups on another replica. If you do that, you got to have both CheckDB and backups running on a replica. Because if you split them on different, on different ones, you could be running CheckDB on a replica that's completely clean, has no corruption problems, but you could be backing up a replica that is corrupt. Just because CheckDB passes on one replica doesn't mean another replica is corruption free. Their storage is unrelated. So if you, one common way to do it is that you offload those onto a replica. You also typically check DB all your passive replicas, like everywhere if you're going to fail over to DR. Or you run the restore and check DB pattern, where as soon as your full backups finish, you have a job kicking off that restores the full backups, does a complete check DB on them, and then off you go. Um, there's another product that uh, is aimed to help people in that position, Minionware. Minionware has a CheckDB product, and I forget the exact name, but if you search for Minionware CheckDB, uh, they have automation built in where you can restore different parts of databases, like doing file group and file restore, restore different parts of databases to different servers to balance the CheckDB out or balance out different file groups, file groups, and, fi and uh, tables to different replicas in an availability group. Um, I, don't, I think, the, if I remember right, Minionware CheckDB is free, uh, but they, they also offer enterprise-level monitoring products. But, and I've also never used it myself. I don't even have clients using it, but it's the kind of thing that if I was in that space, I would go investigate that because I think it's kind of cool. Uh, but the most common one amongst my clients is just that the uh, offload CheckDB and uh, backups over to another replica. A terabyte sounds like a lot, and it is, but these days, like I ran a, a blog post recently. I have a blog post about that. I ran a blog post recently showing how you could run CheckDB in, I want to say it was seven minutes on a half terabyte database. So if you extrapolate that out, and it's 16 times that, so 7 minutes times 16, or so yeah, 7 minutes times 16, you're talking about 2 hours, so about 2 hours to run CheckDB on that if you get a big enough server. It's often a, a server sizing problem. Uh, Mandeep says, what is your favorite feature of SQL Server 2019? Me personally, adaptive memory grants. Adaptive memory grants will constantly change your query's memory based on what the last person's parameters were. If the last person ran a query for big data, you get big data memory. If the last person ran a query for small data, small date ranges, you get small memory. I love that because as a consultant, I make money when people can't figure out why their queries are slow, especially when they can't figure out why their queries are sometimes fast and sometimes slow. That feature is going to be the one that buys me a beach house in Mexico, because for the next 10 years, people will not be able to figure out why in the same hell their SQL server is so slow sometimes and so fast sometimes. 
There's nothing built into the box that makes it obvious that this stuff is happening. I've already started getting consulting clients with that where people who have flipped in uh, 2019 compat level and they are just blown away by how sporadically off and on uh, that query performance goes. Santa knew that was uh, coming. So that's my favorite feature of 2019. Insert evil diabolical laughter here. <laughs> My favorite feature as a as a non sarcastic actual user is probably batch mode on row store. Batch mode on row store, which I can't I, I want to say it's enterprise only. I can't quite remember. Uh, but batch mode on row store will just instantly make your reporting queries faster, even without having to put in column store indexes. That's pretty awesome. And I haven't seen it backfire very often, which was uh, kind of cool. Um, the Peronga says, Masi 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 says, my last question was not precise. I wanted to ask if there's any technique you can advise me for those stored procs that don't ins erase everything for me to insert it again. So it really is, if you're saying go take a contents of a table and then go merge it with another table, that's what merge was supposed to be. Merge was supposed to say, using this data over here, insert rows if they don't exist, delete them if they do exist and they shouldn't be, and so forth. But the problem was the bugs. So the bugs in this, if you search for, oops, merge Aaron Bertrand, if you search for Merge Aaron Bertrand, uh, Aaron has a post out there. Oh, and I can copy paste it in. I forget about that because you're on Twitch, so I can kind of copy paste that across. Uh, reply, more info. Uh, this is a great post about the bugs with the Merge statement. So if I go down further, there's a whole list of bugs in here and whether or not they're fixed or not. So this is why I get a little nervous about that particular piece. Uh, Jan says, a materialized view, that's not really relevant to this problem. Uh, all right, next up, let's see here. Next up, we'll go back over here and... <laughs> Uh, Cobb says, is there a reference for 2019 features and how to be, that can be disabled and how to do it? Yes, if you uh, are in my live class season pass, there is a, in both the mastering query tuning and mastering server tuning classes, there's a list of 2019 features. There's like a module specifically on SQL Server 2019. And in both of them, I give you a rundown of the 2019 features, which ones you should enable and which ones you should disable. So that's in mastering query tuning as uh, the new robots in SQL Server 2019. Those of you with a live class season pass can go hit those. I haven't seen one uh, publicly that gives a good fair rundown. Microsoft, of course, has books online, uh, but they don't give you the honest judgment of this feature is better, this thing makes, this one makes query performance worse, which is why I did the whole module on it, because it was kind of neat. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, CT says over on YouTube, we use change data capture. We ran into lots of issues. The log buffer grew. Yeah, yeah. For me, that's both change data capture and change tracking. When both of them came out, they came out in the same version. I'm like, uh, two features that do basically the same thing inside the same version? Are you sure you really want to do that? And then both the teams kind of vaporized and they didn't do any improvements to them over the course of the next couple few years. I, I don't even know that either feature has had a dollar's worth of work done since. Uh, so I'm just kind of like, oh, that, that makes, it tough to, uh, makes it tough to really recommend either of the features. There's Surly Dev being a hero again. I should give a round of applause for Surly Dev for uh, ma managing the questions here today and making life easier for y'all. Uh, Surly Dev is the moderator here, and he puts in heroic effort to make sure that y'all have a good time. So shout out and kudos to Surly Dev. Uh, let's see. Next up we have... Um, Santi says, <laughs> I love that little emoticon. Santi says, what happens when a query is called with two different parameters with two different row sizes to pull out? Um, that's parameter sniffing. So it's parameter sniffing and SQL Server will sniff whatever parameter comes in first. Now the top may be a little bit different. I assume that you're meaning a, a variable for the top. So let me go show you how that works. <laughs> 
So if I take my same stored procedure over here, we'll take the same exact one that we did last time. I'm going to take out the encryption because I'm actually going to want to see the execution plan here. And this time around, we're going to say get top int. And we'll, we'll I'm going to do the default. I'm not going to do the default value. Uh, so we're going to say select top, get top. So this will let, C let SQL Server get however many rows we specify inside of there. Let's move down just a little so we can see that. OK, so we put that stored procedure into production. Then we're going to free the plan cache. We're going to run it for get latest user, get top equals 500, just to say a, a number inside there. So we'll go run it. And then let's go look to see. Oh, actually, let's, let's get the actual execution plan when we run it to. So let's go run it with get top equals 500. Then let's look over here. And so here's the plan or the query that we got. Select at top at get top. What did SQL Server optimize for? You see how it says 500 there, 500 rows back, back, brought back of 500 expected. That means that SQL Server used the 500 in order to uh, estimate how many rows were going to come back. Now, let's go call it for, say, 1. If I run it for get top equals 1, and then I look at the execution plan, SQL Server still kept that estimate of the first one. This is why I don't really ever like people using a variable for the top. It'll end up getting an estimate that may not be accurate especially if they're going to be wildly different numbers. So if they really desperately have to do it, I'm OK, but just know that it can run you into performance problems down the road, especially if we end up having to do things like sorts inside the execution plan. What if up here it says select top uh, users order by last access date descending? I have an index to support that, so there's no sort down here in the execution plan. But if there was a sort, that's where I would run into memory grant problems. All right, so we'll come back over here and see what else we got. Oh, I should do a shout out to uh, our sponsor again for this week too. So Idera is doing a totally free webcast, Idera Live 2020, on September the 16th. It's a live webcast where you can watch stuff about database administration, execution plans, skills for the year 2020, and more. So that's over at brentozar.com slash go slash Idera Live. You can sign up for it totally free, and it's all day long on Wednesday. They're, I'm sure they're going to record them and let you all get access to the recordings as well. If you can't make it, I would just sign up for that because typically what, they, what companies like this do is they just email you whenever the recordings are live too. They also email you for the rest of your life. This is the price of getting free training. Also, you can tip me in the corner. That's not true. I don't, I don't take tips. I don't want your money. I want much larger than your money. I don't know how that all exactly works. I'm not big on that. I'm just into marketing. I just do stuff. All right, so coming back over here. What else do we have in the questions queue? Let's see. Ian says, why does select server property license type always return uh, disabled? I have no idea what that is. Uh, I've never seen that. Let's go look. So let's see here. So whenever I have to go get server properties, I just go hit the documentation. So SQL Server Server Property, because I want to make sure that I get the exact syntax. Let's go down and see, because you said license type. I, I actually didn't, I don't remember that being a, a, an option. License type. OK, so you asked why it always returns disabled. So I would like to take a moment to remind you that there's product documentation. Microsoft puts a great deal of work into the product documentation. And if you would like to check the documentation, you can Google for it. It's usually the first response. Now, you followed up on YouTube and you said, my question was, why is it disabled? If you would like to know why Microsoft did something, contact your local friendly Microsoft sales representative. Don't contact support because they won't usually tell you why. But if you have friends who work over in sales, like the people who are going to sell your licensing, what you do is you say things like, 
hey, before I go and uh, buy this, can you just tell me the answer to blank? And they will make dang sure that you get the answer to the question that you are looking for. All right, so coming back over to here. 